Welcome to the Motor City Hoops Podcast, your home for all things Detroit Pistons and NBA. Thank you for choosing Motor City Hoops, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to episode 76 of the Motor City Hoops podcast, an instant recap and reaction episode from Thursday night's game versus the Heat. If you are new to the Motor City Hoops podcast, I'm your host, Bryce Simon, a former D1 Hooper, current teacher, coach, husband, father of three amazing kids, and contributor to Detroit Bad Boys of SB Nation. And when I get the chance to watch our Pistons live, I'll do a short episode giving my immediate reactions, recap, and analysis of the game. Segments will include my biggest takeaways, player of the game, plays of the game, things to keep an eye on moving forward, and more. Before we get started with this one, I want to encourage you to go listen to episode 74 of the podcast that I recorded with Ku Cahill of Locked On Pistons, which was a very fun all mailbag episode. I also just dropped my newest breakdown for Detroit Bad Boys, where I dove into the Pistons defense over a three-game span from last weekend. I also want you to encourage you to follow Motor City Hoops on Twitter and subscribe to the YouTube channel so you never miss out on any content we are creating. We're recording this episode immediately after the Pistons' heartbreaking but admiral 112-115 loss to the Heat. Just some pregame notes. Coach Casey, again, does not coach. We've talked about this. I don't know what's going on, but again, we send our thoughts and prayers. Coach Rex gets the nod for the turn third time this season. Cade Cunningham, as we all know, entered COVID protocol on Wednesday, and then that was followed up Thursday, not too long before the game, with Killian Hayes, Isaiah Stewart, Saban Lee, and Rodney Magruder. I don't know if all those guys tested positive or some were close contacts I'm not exactly sure but all those guys were unable to play tonight or unavailable to play tonight so we were left with Hami, JJ, Kojo, Frank Jackson, Bay, Lyles, Garza, the recently signed to a 10-day contract check Diallo that had been playing with the Motor City Crews, and Jamarco Pickett. That's nine guys if you guys are counting. Isaiah Livers was uh, available I guess but not active because of an injury. So the starting lineup was Kojo, Frank Jackson, Hami, Bay, and Lyles. The Heat started Kyle Lowry, Vincent, Duncan Robinson, Struess, and Deadman. No Bam for them, no Jimmy Butler, no Tucker, no Oladipo. First quarter starts out, and Coach Rex had a lob drawn up for Diallo. I really liked it. The play didn't work, but I just loved where his mindset and his mentality was there. I thought that was cool. Just a nice little caveat right there. Start of the game, they're making shots in all game long. This was the story of the game for the Pistons. We'll just go ahead and tell you now, 18 of 40 from the three-point line, 22 of 25 from the free throw line for the game, and it started right from the beginning of the game. They were active defensively. Now, I will say Max Struess is a bucket for the Miami Heat. I'll talk about him a lot on this episode. He had nine of their first 15. We were seeing an aggressive Hamadou Diallo, an aggressive Frank Jackson, and then, of course, Trey Lyles, as always, is aggressive, though he did have a very efficient game tonight. I didn't think Sadiq Bey was quite as aggressive as I wanted, especially early and again I'll talk to about that more later he did eventually get to the free throw line which is kind of the story with him and then he followed that up with the three and did have a nice game these guys were engaged and they were playing hard and it was in the first quarter it ended up being the whole game heat make a late first quarter run that included going zone Garza had some nice hustle plays in that time to keep the game tied. He didn't get a lot of minutes tonight, but it goes 29-29 into the second quarter. 7-0 run to start the quarter and at least steals back some of the momentum after the Pistons led the whole first quarter. So they kind of stole the momentum back. They didn't really extend it, but at least kept the heat from extending any sort of lead on their side of it. The three stopped falling for a little bit, and they were missing some easy shots at the rim. Guys, like, I'm just saying, like, I, I, again, it was admirable what we saw from this team, but I really thought they had a chance to win this game, and I felt like they missed a lot of easy shots at the rim. In this stretch, it was Kojo, JJ, and Lyles, and, and in my notes, I put, will this eventually come back to bite them? Like It should be a double-digit lead right now here in the second quarter, and it wasn't. The Heat actually cut the lead to two, and then the Pistons responded with an 11-0 run. So at half, the Pistons are 45% from the field, 52% from three, 10 of 11 from the free throw line, and out-rebounding the Heat. Lyles with 16, Bay with 11, 6, and 4. Diallo with 10, 4, and 3 at half. But Struess and Hero, the story of the game for the Heat, have 33 of the Heat's 55 at halftime. 
Pistons lead 61-55 going into the third. And again, the guy that keeps bringing up for the Heat, Max Schrue, scores seven straight. But the Pistons continue to answer with multiple three-pointers. Heat eventually take a one-point lead multiple times here in the third quarter. This, this may have been one of the most important stretches of the game for the Detroit Pistons. Like, yeah, maybe you could see how they come out with a ton of energy and kind of surprise the Miami Heat early with everybody that was sitting out. But then I think a lot of people assume that in the second half, the Heat would just take over. Every time the Heat took that one-point lead, the Pistons answered. And they answered and they answered. Lowry made a bucket at the buzzer that gave them an 88-87 lead going into the fourth. And immediately, the Pistons answer again. And then the Heat went on a 6-0 run. But guess what? That's right. Detroit answers yet again, back-to-back and ones from Corey Joseph and then Trey Lyles that tie the game. That was sandwiched around a technical by the not participating in the game, Jimmy Butler, which was kind of interesting. The Pistons get a two-point lead, and guys, they just miss multiple opportunities after getting heat misses to really extend the lead. I think James Edward III tweeted this out that like they had a chance that I don't know if you put the game away, but get a six, eight point, maybe 10 point lead here in the fourth quarter and really feel like you have a great chance to win. And they just weren't able to make some really good opportunities. Happens again, five point lead with three minutes to go. Frank Jackson gets a really, really nice look. He had a great game, but gets a really nice look and just isn't able to make it from three. They're up one. This was the play of the game, but not necessarily in the Pistons' favor. They're up one with a minute 20 to go. Lowry throws the ball essentially to nobody and the ball's just bouncing. It's bouncing. Lowry can't pick it up and Tyler Hero for whatever reason is the guy on the floor that's able to chase it down shot clocks winding down and then he dribbles to the right wing rises up and then bangs a tough tough three as the shot clock expires actually Sadiq Bey is able to match it with a huge mid-range shot from him and then it took another tough three from Max Struess in the corner with Hamid Diallo right in his face to give the Heat this win like it just it took those two huge shots from those guys, a huge night from both of those guys to beat this Pistons team. And then the final play, something I think that will be talked about, is probably going crazy right now on Twitter as we record this. But on the final play, it looks like Trey Lyles. To me, that's who I right now look in placing the blame on. It looked like he was the guy that messed the play up. Like they end up getting nothing out of whatever Coach Rex drew up and don't really get a great look there to try and tie the game at the buzzer after the Heat took that three-point lead. I have four big takeaways. One, COVID finally hit this organization. It was just a matter of time. You know, really this organization through all this has been able to get through it without too much, you know, issues, especially when you look around the league at other teams. Um, And it finally hit and it hit all at once. And first and foremost, you just want to wish all of those players well across the league, across this country. You want to wish everybody well. I know we stick to basketball on this podcast, but I want to make sure everybody knows how much Wes and I care about the health and safety of all of these people, players and non-players included with the COVID pandemic. But there are some new policies coming. and This will be interesting to see if we start getting players back sooner. I think the policy would shorten the sit-out time to six days. Um, and we're starting to see other players and organizations get their players back. That you know Those guys that first went in whenever this really hit, Omicron, K okay, really hit, and you know they went into protocol, now they're coming back. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out with Detroit and to see if other players end up in protocol or not and how long it ends up being before we see some of their, these players back. But again, just thoughts and prayers to those guys and their families. Hope they stay healthy. Um, a tweet from Keith Black Trudeau. People really underestimate how good the end of the bench guy is in the NBA. And when he tweeted that out, I like I had literally just typed it into my notes. If you're anywhere near the NBA, guys, you can play the game of basketball at a high level. Now, I'm not saying, I am not saying that we could see this team play for 82 games at a high level and win a bunch of games and whatever else. Like the Miami Heat weren't at full strength tonight either. So, you, you know, that's part of what we saw, you know, but these guys are into the bench guys. They're playing in the G League. They're around the NBA for a reason. Like we even saw it from Udonis Haslam. I know people are like going crazy because, you know, Haslam had seven points and five rebounds in 11 minutes for the Miami Heat. But like he's a pro. Like he he's a great player. I don't care how old. I mean, I guess eventually age does matter. But like these guys can play the game of basketball at a high level maybe not 30 minutes a night for 82 games, but like, I don't think we can see Sadiq play play 43 minutes every night or Corey Joseph 42 every night and perform at a high level. But on a night, whenever you really have to have it and, and they know they need to step up, like these guys are good basketball players. And I think that really showed tonight that these guys can really play. And even in expanded roles, one thing I really took away, this team can rebound. 
Okay, they can rebound the ball. This was a small team to like tonight. Trey Lyles was the five. Sadiq was the four. Hami at the three. And then you have Corey Joseph and Frank Jackson in the backcourt. You know, Josh Jackson played 21 minutes. Uh, he had three rebounds. Pickett played 15 minutes. He had three rebounds. Garza, four. Check Diallo, two. So it was a very small lineup for most of the night for the Detroit Pistons. And they tied the rebounding battle 43-43 and only gave up six offensive rebounds all night. Now, some of those offensive rebounds were huge, but I thought this team gang rebounded. Like, if there's one silver lining that can hopefully come away from this, it's that they realized how small they were tonight with all these guys out. And they said, we all have to go get involved on the boards. Like, it can't just be Trey Lyles boxing his guy out and getting the rebound. It can't just be Isaiah Stewart getting rebounds or Cade Cunningham individually getting rebounds. They are going to be small this entire year, no matter what. Even when Kelly Olynyk gets back, even when Jeremy Grant gets back, it's not like they're necessarily a big team, but that doesn't mean you have to lose the rebounding battle. You can still be engaged and you can still at least tie, keep it a neutral stat, a neutral area of the game, then be able to win other areas of the game. There was a huge play in the second half after the Pistons had answered a heat run where they get a miss but they left Lyles alone to get the board ended up two free throws for the heat so those are the moments where you got to continue to see this gang rebounding and I hope that's something we see this team take away from this game this is not okay this is not a knock on Hami I love Hamadou Diallo he had 12 tonight six rebounds five assists I thought he played well you know defensively off the ball I'll talk about it later but the things he tried to do tonight I hope, I know it makes me appreciate. I hope it helps you appreciate the thing that Cade makes look really, really easy. Tonight, Hummy tried that like off a ball screen pick and pop. He got, you know, drive and then like the behind the back pass to the big. If you guys remember, uh, Cade had this to Luca Garza a few games ago and Luca Garza made the three. And Hami tried that tonight and the pass was nowhere near on target. And then he had a drive in the second half where he tried to go to a left hand finish at the rim and it just didn't even hit the rim. And again, this is not a knock on Hami. I'm not expecting Hami to do Cade things. All I'm saying is watching Hami try to do things similar to what Cade makes look very, very easy as a rookie in the first half of his rookie season. It just makes me appreciate what Cade is able to do at such a young age. As we move into the players of the game, I think Wes and I have kind of tried to narrow into like, hey, let's do three players of the game every single one of these. And so we have three for you tonight. Trey Lyles, 28 and 8 on 13 attempts, a very efficient night from the field for Trey Lyles. That pump fake continues to be one of the best pump fakes in the league. He had some huge buckets, some huge moments for this team, played 37 minutes. He did have four turnovers, but that's going to happen when his usage is what it is. I'm kind of interested to see how his game translates as we start to get these guys back in a couple of weeks. I can't tell you, I'll talk about that a little bit later as we get um, into the things to keep an eye on. He did have four blocks tonight as well, kind of an underlooked part of his game that we've seen in the last week or so. Frank Jackson had 19 points, hit some nice shots. He was four of 10 from the three-point line. And I do believe he's playing on a bum ankle. You could see him limping around a little bit. And then Sadiq Bey, even though he wasn't as aggressive as what I wanted to see based on the personnel we had, he did have 23, 10, and 5 tonight on 13 attempts. So he had four turnovers, but a really good game from Sadiq Bay. All I would say is these are the type of games we want to see Sadiq when we have Cade and we have Jeremy or whoever, if we end up trading Jeremy, when Olenek's on the floor, when Killian Hayes. Like these are the games I want to see from him when we're at full strength. I would have liked to see him get 20 shots tonight, not being full strength and with the personnel we we're having to play. So that's, I think Sadiq's still trying to figure out like, when do I be aggressive? When do I not? He's trying to find his flow, like his role, I guess, and where he can be most successful. I thought he played well tonight. Again, would have liked to see him be more aggressive. But if this is the Sadiq we can see for the rest of the season, that would be huge. Just two plays of the game. Mid third, the Heat take a one point lead. I talked about how the Pistons were able to answer. Frank Jackson hits a huge three. And then the Pistons forced a turnover and what had a wide open, I believe, Duncan Robinson under the rim. So instead of a layup for him, it ends up being a turnover the other way and Lyles gets a two. So a huge response there by the Pistons. We talked a lot about this earlier in the year, like momentum changing plays. And the Pistons actually had a lot of those where the momentum really could have swung all the way to Miami and it just didn't. And then the second one was that Bay mid-range to tie the game. Again, a lot of momentum against the Pistons at that moment. Looked like the Heat were probably just, I think, I believe it was about a minute or so left in the game. And he hit a really, really tough contested mid-range shot. Three things to keep an eye on tonight. What players will be signed to replace these players in protocol? You know, it's, it's calling the hardship contracts or whatever. You know, the, the league has made it to where you, I believe for every player that goes into protocol, you can sign a player to replace them. So, 
who are these guys going to be? We saw it be Czech Diallo tonight, even though he didn't play a ton. Are there other G League guys for the Motor City Crews that we see called up? Are there other G League guys for other organizations, other guys just floating around out there as we've seen guys like Joe Johnson get you know, signed to go play in a game for the Boston Celtics. Isaiah Thomas is playing major minutes for the Lakers right now. Like, who are these guys going to be that the Pistons end up signing um, for at least the next two or three games? And again, if other players in, end up in protocol for this Pistons organization, it could be even longer. I do have to mention, you know, friend of the show, friend of ours, Ku Cahill's tweet. You know, he said, Michael Beasley, Jimmer Fredette, Anthony Randolph. Those were the guys. You know, I think there's a lot of guys. Omari, you know, who's coming on to record with us on Monday, dropping on Tuesday, the weekly episode, I think he tweeted out and got a ton of responses about like, who's the guy you would want to see signed in this scenario. I tweeted out Allen Iverson. That is, I got to learn that I got to stop tweeting about Allen Iverson. I know that's not necessarily a guy that's real beloved in the Pistons community. And so I have to remember that as I haven't been here very long. Um, I do want to say of the three guys who tweeted out, like Michael Beasley is a bucket, guys. Like he can get, but and Jimmer Fredette's a bucket too. I, I would assume he's playing overseas right now. I don't know that for sure. So I don't know if he can make it over and do that. But, um, you know, Michael Beasley would be kind of interesting. So on to the second thing. How do certain guys look being surrounded by players? I don't want to say that, that aren't as talented. You don't have the star power, right? So Cade's out. Olenek's out, Jeremy Grant's out for you know a variety of reasons with those guys. Killian's not even playing, Isaiah's not playing. Like some guys can look the same, or some guys look better when you're not surrounded by that talent. Like, you know, Trey Lyles had a huge game tonight. I thought he looked really, really good. So my question is: as if he looks that good, is he able to then take that and translate it into something as substance when those guys come back? Like, that's very interesting. Some guys really struggle to play with lesser talent around them. Like, I feel like I was that guy because because my game was predicated on other guys getting me shots and I had a high basketball IQ. And so I felt like I played better when I was with other guys that had high basketball IQ as well. So will we see some guys not look very good over this three game stretch because they're not surrounded by Cade and Killian and those types of guys that have high basketball IQ and, you know, conceivably make the game easier on you. So I'm really interested to see how those guys look. And then also if they play better or if they play worse, how does that eventually translate to their games whenever this team gets fully healthy? Like Sadiq Bey, let's say he scores 25 for the next three, four games with those guys out. Then is he able to continue to do that when they return? Like, is it is it going to be hard to then fall back into a role that he hasn't been playing for these three games? I just do. I do think that'll be something interesting to watch for. Um, as these guys recover from health and safety protocol. And then Hami off the ball defense, I alluded to it earlier at least four times. I think this was in the first half too, at least four times off the ball where it directly led to a bucket for the Heat. And I I, I just like Hami so much. I like his game. I'm such a fan. I think he can be a contributor for this organization long-term, not necessarily in the starting lineup, probably coming off the bench. I just think he does a lot of really nice things. He was in the dunker spot tonight, should have had a dunk, but – Kojo ended up getting called for an offensive foul. Like, I really like it, but he's got to get better in some of these other areas. Like, I can't, you know, preach, you know, the rebounding and, you know, the athleticism, all that, if he's just getting cooked off the ball defensively. And I'm just not sure if that's something we're going to see him improve or not. One nice little development we've seen is in his mid-range game. I think he hit a couple tonight. He got fouled on another and went to the free throw line. You know, it's not even about – he was 2 of 4 from the three-point line. I'm not sure I put a lot of stock in that. I don't think that's going to be the deciding factor for his game. I really think it's going to be about finishing at a high level at the rim. That mid-range game, if he can at least be a two-level scorer in that way in those two areas, and then finding other ways to contribute and just – flat out being better defensively. He has to be better defensively, especially off the ball. Some thoughts on the other team, the Miami Heat. Max Struess is a guy I really like, guys. Whenever I've watched him play, again, I've told you guys this multiple times, I don't necessarily have time to watch a lot of other games outside of the Pistons in terms of NBA. I will be watching the you know those Christmas Day games and all of that. I try to when I get the chance, but when you know we've seen this Heat team twice here recently, and I thought Max Struess was really good. Just looking at box scores, he's a guy that's been having a really nice little stretch and I'm just interested to see what his long-term impact will be for them as they start to get guys healthy is he going to continue to be in the rotation I would assume so I'm just interested to see as this is a team that will be in the playoffs and some people think playing for a championship how much of an impact will he be and what I really liked uh, to start the second half you saw Detroit try to take away his three-point shooting and he immediately went to the basket and made him pay that way Tyler Hero is also a straight bucket you know a guy that didn't play the first 
first time the Pistons played the Heat a couple days ago. And then he, I think he had a big game in his return for the Heat two nights ago. And then tonight he has 29 points. As I, you know, I talked about those two guys hit those two really, really tough threes at the end of the game that kind of won this game for Miami. Without those two guys, you know, obviously scoring the way they scored the Pistons win this game in double digits like I I've, I can say that very confidently if those guys just don't go bananas like what I felt like they did I mean they hit eight threes between between them eight of 18 from the three-point line between Hero and Struess so without those guys I think the Pistons definitely win this game but I really really impressed from those two guys especially scoring the basket and really Tyler Hero's ability to make tough shots you know tough threes off the dribble mid-range okay and then I'm not sure I've been super impressed by any other members of the Roster. Now I know Bam's out and um, Jimmy Butler's out, and those are you know probably arguably their two best players. Robinson just simply hasn't shot the ball well in the two meetings that we've watched, so that's probably why with him. But you know it'd be interesting to team that this wasn't a team I was super high on in the off season, um, so I'm interested to see as they continue to go. A quick look ahead to Sunday. We will not be doing an instant recap. I'll be traveling back from my in laws where we're spending the next few days. We'll be traveling back to our hometown on Sunday and then doing uh, Christmas with you know just our family just my wife and our kids Monday morning I'll watch the game eventually but I won't be able to do an instant recap Sunday we'll have Tuesday coming with Omari the drop for the weekly episode but we play the Spurs on Sunday night they're 12 and 18 right now I believe they're playing as we record this episode actually their game hasn't even started with the Lakers so I don't have any updates on that but they are playing the Lakers on Thursday night. They're first in the NBA in assists per game, fourth in field goal percentage, but not a team that shoots a ton of threes. So I'm kind of interested to watch the Spurs team. Sounds like a team that plays together real well, shares the ball. So that'll be an interesting challenge for the Pistons defense. You know, it's not necessarily guarding a guy or, or one or two guys that carry the load for the other team, but, you know, guarding a, a complete team of guys. I believe they have seven players that average 11 points a game or more and an eighth guy that averages eight points a game or more. DeJounte Murray having a heck of a year, almost averaging a triple-double. I think he was part of our Sheeter Sham here a month or two ago. Not a single member of their team. Uh, Murray averages the most on their team, I think, um, like, Nine, right around 19 points a game or something like that. So a very even scoring team. So it'll be interesting to see how the Pistons defense stacks up against a team like that. Not necessarily a team that relies on one or two guys. And they're also a team, what I was able to research and find, a team that's not currently dealing with any COVID protocols themselves. You know, there's been a couple teams in the association that it's been hit harder for than others. And then a couple that it really hasn't been hit at all. I believe the Phoenix Suns are another team that I saw someone tweet out today that, you know, COVID hasn't really bothered them. It seems like the Spurs have been able to avoid it so far. So hopefully that's something that continues for their organization. And again, hopefully something for the Pistons organization that is short lived and everybody's able to stay healthy. As always, I want to thank my guy, Wes Davenport. Guys, he literally like got to wherever he was going for Christmas, got, unloaded the car as fast as possible, sat down. I'm sure his wife, you know, I'm probably not his wife's favorite person. I don't know if he's at his family's or in his in laws. We haven't had a chance to talk about it yet, but I'm, I may not be the most, you know, favorite of those families right now as he went right to recording this and making the notes for me, but I appreciate it so much. He's the producer of the Motor City Hoops podcast and does everything to make this better and easier. I also want to thank you, the listener, for taking time out of your day to listen to the podcast. One thing Wes and I talk about often is continuing to put out good, quality, energetic content regardless of the ups and downs of the season for the Pistons and we hope you see and hear that every episode that's one reason I was so adamant about doing this episode even though Wes and I were both on the road was I wanted people to know I don't care how many people are out for the Pistons or whatever we're going to watch this game and we're going to recap this game it ended up being a great game obviously but we're going to do it whether they won by 40 lost by 40 or the result was what it was and I hope you guys are enjoying it Motor City Hoops will be back on Tuesday with our normal weekly episode drop for that episode we'll be welcome back on Mari Sankofa, Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press, for the third time for a great episode discussing all the news and storylines around this team. This will be the final Motor City Hoops episode before Christmas, so I want to make sure Motor City Hoops wishes all of you a safe, joyous, and healthy holiday. Thank you for listening. Go Pistons, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Motor City Hoops podcast. Please give us a rating, drop a review, and subscribe. For more content, including video breakdowns, make sure you follow us at Motor City Hoops on Twitter. I hope you join us next episode. Until then, be safe and be well.